Jude 8 to 16. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious one. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But those people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are blemishes on your love feasts, and they feast with you without fear, looking after themselves. Waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires that they are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. What a uplifting word. Of, <laughs> but we kind of looked at this a little bit yesterday, and we'll dig in just slightly more today. You see, Judas told us how they pollute, how, how this happens and how this pollutes us inwardly first. It affects us inwardly. Then it begins to cause a rejection to authority, to spiritual authority around us. And, and then it causes sin, well, like in ages past. And he gives examples of all of these sins. The examples of Cain and Balaam and Korah. And now we see that the effect of sin, well, it's affecting other things. It's affecting the holy feasts when we should be joining together uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ, and it was affecting those feast times. It was creating a selfishness. Remember, Paul would talk to the Corinthians about this because they were eating in an unjust manner. And what Paul was talking about was not that, you know, an unworthiness necessarily inside, which that's something we watch out for, but he primarily was talking about the rich who were gorging themselves and then the poor had nothing left. The rich were eating first and the Poor in society, the lower class were eating less. The slaves, the servants, they were all forced to eat last. Even inside the church, there was still a hierarchy. And Paul, um, well, Paul let them have it for that. And Jude's doing the same. It affects our holy feasts. It, it creates this self-searching or self-serving nature that we put ourselves above others. What, did, what were we told by Christ? To love each other, right? To love one another. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? That we should be seeking them, giving them deference over our own self. But we grow it naturally in a self-serving, self-seeking sort of nature. Grows into empty promises. Our word can't be trusted. We say things, but we won't do it. Leads to a hypocritical life. coming to church, hearing the words of holiness, and then not even trying to go out and let it change our actions and attitudes. Now, it doesn't mean that we're all perfect, right? You know, don't, don't hear that. That's not a, you come to church, you hear the message, you better obey it right now. No, it's, we're all growing. We're on a journey. We're all daily seeking to get closer and closer to God, but we can't stop that journey. We need to seek to let our actions and our attitudes portray that of Christ. And when they don't, then, well, we're the first to apologize. It leads to shameful lifestyles. Gloating in sin, gloating in even riches. I mean, that's the American dream, isn't it? The bigger, the better, the, the, the more money. And when we go contrary to that, 
the world doesn't understand it, but we get drawn into the shameful lifestyles where we're living, even in the church, more in debt in our lives than ever before. And then it talks about their dire destiny, aware without repentance, they're destined for eternal darkness. He says they're twice dead twice did. And he quotes in verse 14 from the book of Enoch. Now, remember, the book of Enoch was an apocryphal book. It was added in the 1500s by the Catholic Church. It was known, but it was never treated as scripture. It was known as something you could read, kind of like, well, you know, you can learn from La Miserable, or you can learn from other things, and you could quote these and as something that would bless you, but it was not meant to be scriptural that you would base your life and your theology on. But he quotes from this book of Enoch, he says, you will be judged. And the scariest is who these people turn out to be. For me, at least, as you read this list, as you read through this whole passage, I mean, he's letting them have it. And then he goes, and who are these people? Verse 16, these are the grumblers, the malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. Wait, you mean they're not like uh, murderers, adulterers? They're, they're, wow. Th this list of sin is often ignored because, well, it's not a big glorified deep sins. It's sins of personality, sins of pride. Gossiping, grumbling. It's easy to read these lists and, and fill it in with other people and point fingers at other people, yet it's, easier if we take a second and just say, wow, is that me? Is that me? Do I grumble? When something doesn't go my way, do I, do I grumble? Ever told somebody you didn't like something? Grumbling. Ever told somebody you didn't like something in the church or something about the pastors or, or, or something about a ministry or something about grumbling? filled with malcontent. We just qualified ourselves, didn't we? We like to read it about other people, but so often these are even us, if we're not careful there, but by the grace of God, right? If this list was to describe the enemy, then if we look in the mirror, the enemy sometimes is us. We're our own enemies. We're our own worst nightmares sometimes. Yeah, we get tired, we get a headache, and we begin to grumble. It happens. We grow malcontent. And this is why Jesus in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, told us this. He said, judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. You know, in our house, there's been some sinus stuff going on. And if you've ever had that sinus drainage where you can't blow it, it's not in your nose, but it's just draining down your throat. And so you hear a lot of the, you know, all of that going on. So hopefully you heard that really well with the microphone, but uh in our house, there was some of that going on, and uh, um, one of the siblings said to the other sibling, would you just blow your nose already? And like every five seconds, would you stop it? Blow your nose, blow your nose. And they kept going, I can't, I can't, I can't. And it's kind of ironic, because when you judge, by the same standard, you will be judged. And a week later, the first child is now feeling better. The second child is now constantly going, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, just constantly. And you want to just go over and say, hey, 
Do you remember last week when you picked on your sibling? Now it's you. They could be doing that to you every five seconds, and they're not. Huh. Judge not, lest you be judged, right? And now this doesn't mean, now notice this passage, it goes on to talk about how when you've removed the speck from your own eye. Now that doesn't mean that we're ever perfect, right? We are not perfect. Therefore, we cannot perfectly judge others. There is only one judge, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can judge. The Holy Spirit is who convicts, but that does not mean that we can't, when we continue to live in a matter of repentance, walk alongside somebody and try to point them to the truth and go, do you think that's really helping in your life? Or is that hurting you? Is that bringing you closer to God or drawing you further away and helping them to think about it through the Holy Spirit? Divine judgment is coming for all of us. May we walk in grace and repentance and always abiding with him, abiding in Jesus, not falling to grumbling or malcontent or those who follow their own passions, their own selfish desires, their own me first mentalities. I just need to work on me. We live surrounded by a world that says these things. And yet the world is looking for, well, I mean, look at your YouTube feeds. There's videos of heroes. I just saw this morning a news headline. I didn't read the article, but a woman, I think in Pennsylvania, who is seeking her good Samaritan who saved her from a car crash. They saved her and then left. They didn't stay around for their name to be recognized. The world is seeking selfless people who are willing to walk alongside them, to care about them, and to show them that God cares even more. Not falling to our own passions, our own self-desires. And then the last one, it says that they are loud-mouthed boasters. Boasting about everything. You know, do you realize we can do that in the church sometimes? When you see somebody working at a food kitchen, feeding the homeless, and they have to post it all over the internet. I could tell story after story of individuals who've come into my office or sent me emails that we've talked through and counseled through that have surrendered to Christ, grown in a deeper relationship with him. But we aren't. Because all that would do is seek to pat me on the back. And I'm not about that. Some are, and that's okay. God even talks about the reward is now. The reward won't be in heaven because they've already received the reward before man now. He said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, this doesn't mean that we might not have a small group that we're doing ministry together with because we're supposed to go out two by two, if not more, right? And that you're worshiping and sharing that with each other. But not on social media. Not telling the world that I did this great deed. Because that's a loudmouth boaster. I'm boasting about what I've done not what God is doing. So what do we do? If we fall into that loud mouth, mouth boasting, seeking favoritism to gain advantages, grumblers, malcontents, what, what do we do? When we look in the mirror and we see that that is us, what do we do? Well, simply, 
We walk in repentance. You know, may we never be an individual that corrupts the community of God through these things. Jesus said, he who is not for me is against me. I don't ever want to be against God. I don't ever want to do something that could cause somebody not to look to God. By my life or my death, may it bring him glory. So what do we do? We walk every day in humble submission to the Holy Spirit. Repentance. We humble ourselves. Now remember, humbling yourself does not mean that you think of your uh, think of yourself less, right? That you think or you think less of yourself. That's how we ought to say it. You think less of yourself. It's you think of yourself less. Humility doesn't mean you have a woe is me, meek attitude. Weak attitude. That's weak, right? Meekness would be more in line with humility. It doesn't mean that you don't share stories. I just this week shared stories in relation to someone who is challenged with the tithe and challenged wanting, thinking they, that God is calling them to give above and beyond and to give off of gross, not net, and all of those type of things. And so simply, I, I shared some verses, but I shared what God did in Mandy and Mai's life when it came to trusting him with our giving. And that wasn't to point glory at us. That was to point glory at what God has done. And that was in a small circle. Not on Facebook. Not going to happen. We humble ourselves. We abide in him. Seeking him each and every day. Growing in him. Walking with him. We pray without ceasing. How do we do that? There's a great book called Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence was a monk who hated Vespers. He hated the hourly prayer things and, you know, getting together at the, um, often it was 6, 9, 12, 3, 6, and 9, and you would get together and you would pray for a half hour or sit in silence. And he's like, no, I, I can be praying when I peel potatoes in the kitchen. And he began to, speak about practicing a continual presence of God, keeping your mind always before the throne, continually making sure your heart is always at the feet of God, practicing that presence, not just a temporary prayer moment. It's a beautiful book. I challenge you to read it if you've not. Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. It's a classic and it's just a collection of letters. Letters that he wrote to other individuals explaining and describing this idea of just being in God's presence. Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Casting Crown says, it's a life song. Let, may my life song sing to you. That's prayer. May we breathe in and breathe out God's name. As the Hebrews would say with the Yah, Yah, Yahweh. Breathing out and breathing in the name of God. May our every moment be about giving him glory. Whatever you do, it says, in word or deed, do it all for the glory of God. His praise. Do it for his praise and his glory. Do it in his name and in his strength. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that we would not be individuals of grumblers, malcontents, complaining about other people, letting other people cause us not to be in church, but that we seek you first. Now, I, somebody once recently was talking about how, well, I don't, I don't like it when other people preach. I only want to hear my pastor. And I'm like, but you didn't come to hear the pastor, you should have came to hear the message. The message is more important than the deliverer. The message is greater and life-changing than it is on who actually spoke it. The message of God through the Holy Spirit is what grows us, not the person speaking it. 
may we be careful that we don't mix up the things of God. We want to hear your voice, God, not whoever you choose to give the message. May we be willing to hear it from the newest believer and the oldest saint, the youngest child, and the stranger. Whoever it might be, Lord, that you use to give us the message, may we be willing to hear. Because the message is more important than the one who speaks it. God, give us strength to be your people that walk around taking the specks out of our, or planks out of our own eyes so that we can help others with the speck that's in theirs. Help us to seek first, to humble ourselves before you each and every day, to daily die, daily pick up our cross, daily, intentionally, sometimes hourly, so that we can shine bright your light into this world that needs your hope and comfort and joy and peace. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, go in peace, and I pray you have a great rest of the afternoon.